And that's when I first saw this thing coming straight down, just like an elevator. I rushed out to see what it was, and by that time, there was a hatchway opening up in the top of it, just like the trunk of your car. So, uh, I noticed this little man, the uh, same size of a man, right to the side, the right side of the hatchway, cooking, uh, cooking these pancakes, which I have one here yet. Uh, he was, he was frying these, these pancakes, and, uh, I pointed to him and made a gesture like eating. I thought maybe I'd get a conversation out of him. Nobody was saying anything. But he, uh, he didn't say a word. He just reached over and he got a handful of them, four of them, and he handed them down to me, and, uh, they were hot and greasy. Welcome to Extraterrestrial Reality. Well, that little cold opening was a segment from a documentary that appeared on television in 1965 called Of Saucers and Believers. Uh, it was uh, produced by uh, NBC out of Chicago. And uh, that little segment there, of course, it features a gentleman uh, who has now passed on uh, named Joe Simonton. And he had an incredible story. Uh, he saw a flying saucer. He saw alien creatures. And he was also given food, uh, what he described as pancakes by these beings. Uh, it was a big story at the time. That unfortunately, he was ridiculed by a lot of people, a lot of newspapers. But uh, uh, strangely enough, uh, Project Blue Book investigated it, and uh, uh, they listed it as unexplained. And we're going to talk about this whole thing, and also I will feature the entire segment uh, later on as we uh, talk about this uh, a little bit more first. Uh, actually, uh, I want to talk about Joe Simonton first. He was a, a plumber, a chicken farmer, uh, an auctioneer, and he played Santa Claus uh, at Christmas time for the kids. And anyway, uh, I'm going to read a little bit of an article from Discogs about this. It says here, A close encounter of the third kind is an actual meeting between humans and extraterrestrials, and Simonton's is easily the uh, state of Wisconsin's best known. Despite the unlikely manner in which the story unfolded, the episode survived a rigorous assessment by the United States Air Force and is uh, carried in their files as unexplained. In 1961, Joe Simonton was a plumber, auctioneer, and Santa Claus. Also, he was a chicken farmer. Uh, annually, for the, he was a Santa Claus annually for the Eagle River Chamber of Commerce. He reported his age as 55 or 60, depending on the interviewer. Well, at the time of the incident, which occurred in 1961, he was actually 60 years old. I actually did a little, little research on this, and he was born in 1901, uh, February of 1901. And this incident happened uh, on April 6, uh, excuse me, April uh, 18th. Uh, at 11 a.m. in 1961, so he would have been uh, 60 years old at the time. Now, when you saw uh, the interview, uh, that was uh, obviously that was filmed in 1965, so he would have been uh, 64 at, uh, by that point. But anyway, it says here Simonton was having a late breakfast when he heard a sound like that of a jet being throttled back, something like the sound of a of knobby tires on wet pavement. He went into the yard and saw a flying saucer drop out of the sky and hover over his farm. It was silver and brighter than chrome, 12 feet in height and 30 feet in diameter. On one edge were what appeared to be exhaust pipes, six or seven inches in diameter. The disc landed and a hatch opened opened up. Inside were three dark-skinned aliens, each about five feet tall and weighing about 125 pounds. They appeared to be between 25 and 30 years old and were dressed in dark blue or black knit uniforms with turtleneck tops and helmet-like caps. They were clean-shaven, Simonton said, and Italian-looking. The aliens did not speak in his presence, but they had a silvery jug with two handles, heavier than aluminum but lighter than steel, about a foot high. It seemed to be made out of the same material as the craft. Simonton said it was a beautiful thing, a thermos jug-like bottle, quite unlike any jug I have ever seen here on Earth. And then, uh, this is interesting, he, uh, that he doesn't know, he... he said that they motioned him to uh, get him some water, and so that's what he uh, he did. He actually took the thermos and grabbed him some water. Uh, he says here, through ESP or something, Simonton got the idea that the aliens wanted water. He left the visitors, filled the jug from, uh, from the water pump in his basement, then returned to the craft and gave the jug back. To, d to do this, he had to brace himself against the UFO's hull and stretch up. From the subsequent Air Force report, looking into the saucer, he saw a man cooking on some kind of flameless cooking appliance. The alien was preparing pancakes. 
Now, let's just stop right there. Uh, before we continue here, I'm going to uh, play the entire segment here from uh, 1965 uh, from that uh, episode of, of Saucers and Believers uh, that, was, that, appeared, that was televised back then. Check this out. This is very interesting. And you'll hear it right from the horse's mouth, Joe Simonton. Where do you meet someone from outer space? Perhaps in the North Woods. Joe Simonton of Eagle River, Wisconsin, spins a yarn about an April morning in 1961. A morning when, he says, he came face to face with another world. Uh, right here is where this uh, flying saucer, this UFO, landed. Right here about where I'm standing. And uh, it was a big, huge thing, and uh, I wondered what the heck it was. I was in my kitchen uh, having a bite of lunch. And I turned around, put the dishes in the sink, and I looked out the window, and that's when I first saw this thing coming straight down, just like an elevator. And uh, first I thought the roof went off of my house, and I thought, no, the roof is green, and this is bright. What the heck is it? So I rushed out to see what it was, and by that time, there was a hatchway opening up in the top of it, just like the trunk of your car. And then there, there stood a little man, I say a little man, about five foot tall, holding up a jug or uh, a container, and he motioned they wanted to drink. He motioned for water. So I walked up to him to get this jug, and uh, I looked at his eyes, and they were so penetrating that I had to look away. So I went to the basement to get this water, and uh, I thought, well, they want water, so I'll take it up to them and see what happens. And with that, I brought the water up, and he was looking at me when I first came out of the basement. But I didn't look at his face until I got right up to him. Then I looked up, and I handed the jug up with both hands, and I had that same look in his eyes, a sort of a penetrating look. And uh, when he took the water, I balanced myself with this hand against the machine, and I stepped back a few steps. And then... Uh, uh, with that, uh, he set the jug down, and he gave me a salute with the back of his hand, a gesture of thanks, I presume. And then, uh, well, I gave him my salute. What am I going to do? So uh, I noticed this little man, the uh, same size of a man, right to the side, the right side of the hatchway, cooking, uh, cooking these pancakes, which I have one here yet. Uh, he, were, he was frying these, these pancakes, and uh, I pointed to him and made a gesture like eating. I thought maybe I'd get a conversation out of him. Nobody was saying anything. But he, uh, he didn't say a word. He just reached over and he got a handful of them, the four of them, and he handed them down to me. And uh, they were hot and greasy. And this uh, man cooking these pancakes, it was on a square uh, grill-like concern. I couldn't see any flame, but it seemed to be very hot. There was smoke coming from it. And uh, if that was their food, God help them, because I took a bite of one of them, and it tasted like a piece of cardboard. And uh, if that's what they lived on, no wonder they're small. And with that, he reached up and he closed his hatch with a heavy thud, click-like, and it latched. And you couldn't a bit more see where that hatch was than you could see a hole in my hand. And uh, with that, the thing started to raise, just like it came down. Everything was time perfect. It went up about 20 feet. It tilted a 45 degree straight south and shot off. And within uh, two or three seconds, it was out of sight. Well, there I stood in the driveway with a handful of greasy pancakes and my mouth open, wondering what the heck I saw, what had happened. It is outside the realm of the Air Force to pass judgment on Mr. Simonton's case. However, the pancakes that he turned over to the Air Force were turned over to the food and drug people, and they were analyzed as pure buckwheat pancakes. As you can see, he was a very, very believable person. Uh, it doesn't seem like he was making this up. And actually, he told the same story again. When uh, everything was, he, he, this, the story never deviated from uh, the original story that he told over all the years 
uh, when he was asked, asked about this. Anyway, let's uh, continue with this article. It says here, the interior of the UFO was dull black, even the three extremely beautiful instrument panels, and had the appearance of wrought iron. The contrast between the dark interior and shiny ex ex exterior so fascinated Simonton that he later said that he, could, he would love to have a room painted in the same way. In return for the water, one of the aliens, the only one with narrow red trim on his trousers, presented Simonton with uh, three of the pancakes. Actually, in the interview, as we played earlier, it was actually four pancakes, not three. Uh, so it was actually with four of the pancakes, hot from the griddle. As he did so, the alien touched his own forehead, apparently a salute in thanks to Simonton for his help. Simonton saluted back. Each of the pancakes was roughly three inches in diameter and perforated with small holes. Yeah, the pancakes looked really strange. They don't want, weren't like your, the, the kind of pancakes that mom used to make, I can tell you that. They don't look like that at all. Very thin looking. And of course, as he said there, he doesn't know how he could understand, you know, they tasted like cardboard to him. He doesn't understand, uh, he understands actually, he, he understood if the, that's why these beings don't, uh, uh, or don't uh, weigh that much or grow that tall because if that's what they're eating, uh, there's not, not much to it. The head alien then connected a line or belt to a hook in his clothing and the hatch closed. The saucer rose about 20 feet and took off to the south at a 45 degree angle. Its wake lifted a blast of air that tossed the tops of nearby pine trees. The craft took only two seconds to disappear from view. This must have been an incredible uh, sight to see, something like this. I mean, he's standing there, and of course, as he stated in his interview there that we watched, uh, he was completely dumbfounded. Uh, and then Simonton ate one of the pancakes, ostensibly in the interest of science. It tasted like cardboard, he told the Associated Press. The other two, the other pancakes he gave to the Villas County Judge Frank Carter, a local UFO enthusiast. Carter, who called the aliens saucer knots, uh, said he believed Simonton's story since he could not think of any way in which the farmer might profit from a hoax. Carter's son, Colin, today a lawyer in Eagle River, told me, I recall as a youngster that my dad took it very seriously. Judge Carter sent the pancakes to what was the country's top investigative group, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, or NICAP. They refused the opportunity to check it out. They put a damper on Judge Carter's plans. He had wanted to hold a seminar on the, in on the incident. By this time, Simonton said he was irked by reporters making fun of the situation and laughing. But here's where the story gets interesting because uh, Project Blue Book swooped in and uh, they, they didn't make fun of him. It says here, in response to all this, the Air Force dispatched its civilian UFO investigator, J. Allen Hynek. Hynek at the time was an astronomer at Northwestern University. He later became convinced that UFOs are real and founded his own investigative agency, which took over NICAP's files after the group folded. Uh, thanks to Hynek, a Northwestern University committee and the Air Force's Technical Intelligence Center analyzed one of Simonton's pancakes and found it to be made of flour, sugar, and grease. It was rumored, however, that the wheat in the pancakes was of an unknown type. And I also, also want to point out that it was also rumored in an episode of Ancient Aliens, uh, yes, the food of the gods, it was talked about there that there was no salt uh, inside those uh, pancakes. Uh, so it was a very mysterious uh, kind of pancake, but... Uh, who knows? Uh, we'll talk about that later, what all this means. The private Air Force response was unearthed after a little detective work. It comes from a UFO handbook for Air Force personnel written by Lloyd Mallon and issued in a popular edition by Science and Mechanics Publishing Company. In the book, Mallon refers to J.S., a highly regarded, much respected citizen of Eagle River, Wisconsin, a small rural commu community noted for its attractiveness to tourists. Uh, continuing here, and, and this guy, the writer of this uh, article, jokes, says, unless there are more space pancake recipients in Eagle River than otherwise reported, we can safely see through Mallon's clever attempt at disguise and positively identify J.S. as Joe Simonton. One Air Force investigator, according to Mallon, said that Simonton appeared quite sincere to me, did not appear to be a perpetrator of a hoax. But an Air Force Aeronautical Systems Division psychiatrist believed that Simonton had suffered a hallucination and subsequent delusion. Of course, of course, there's, they're gonna, somebody's going to say that, right? The Air Technical Intelligence Center investigator said, quote, cases of this type could be injurious to the mental health of the individual if he became upset due to the experience. It was pointed out that the experiences of this type 
uh, hallucinations followed by delusion are all are not at all uncommon and especially in rural communities. So I just want people out there to understand, especially if you're living in a rural community, it's it's not uncommon for uh, a lot of you folks living in rural communities. I live in a rural community. A lot of people uh, in this world live in rural communities, but apparently we're all prone to hallucinations, uh, which uh, unfortunately is followed by delusion. Uh, con continuing here, it says, Additionally, according to Malin, the Air Force took to heart an unsub unsubstantiated rumor circulated by, among others, Raymond Palmer, a publisher of Pulp, Flying Saucer, and Science Fiction magazines. Palmer reported to the Air Force his belief that Simonton had been hypnotized by an Eagle River real estate broker and was fed the pancake story so that he would repeat it and appear truthful. The motivation for this was economic for the purpose of a, quote, miniature Disneyland that is or was being built in the area. Uh, I don't know what, uh, okay, so let's, let's, uh, that, now that is actually more preposterous than the idea of extraterrestrials landing and handing Joe Simonton pancakes. The idea that some real estate broker showed up, hypnotized him, you know, yeah, you're going to sleep now, listen, uh, you're under my control now. Uh, now look at we need to get we're, we want to get a minute maybe we'll get walt disney here to check out this site we want to come up with some crazy story right and we, we, we need it to be believable so you have to believe this in your mind this really happened and when this is all over when i'm done hypnotize you uh i wasn't here but anyway this is what i want you to say say a, a flying saucer landed right outside your house and some aliens came looking for some water so you you filled up your jug of water right and then uh and then you, they gave you some pancakes and uh here's these pancakes i'm not really giving them to you when you wake up out of this hyp hypnotic state it was actually uh the aliens aliens gave you these not me in fact i wasn't even here that's basically what the uh trying to, he's trying to he was trying to say there uh raymond palmer which is absolutely absurd that's that's about as absurd actually as the uh traveling puppeteer tr uh sh troop that uh, uh was actually responsible for the aerial school ufo incident uh that was uh, put put forth that was uh uh championed by uh debunker mick west <clears throat> Anyway, continuing with this article, it says, To understand how incredible the rumor was, it is useful to look at the credibility of Palmer himself. One of his favorite theories was that flying saucers came from a secret hollow earth civilization ruled by a race called Detrimental Robots, which he abbreviated as Daros. According to Palmer, the Daros manipulated humanity with their projected thought rays. Palmer's primary source, actually his only source, was a Pennsylvania welder who drew upon, quote, racial memory, end quote, for his accounts. There apparently is no mention in Air Force files of the possibility that the Darrow's thought ray had been turned upon real estate agents or Palmer or even the Air Force, though I believe there is as much evidence for that as for an Eagle River Disneyland. Uh, continuing here, it says, but based on such sound evidence, the Air Technical Intelligence Center, which headquartered Air Force UFO investigations, let the matter drop. Publicly, it was a mystery. The classified reason re revealed to Malin was that the Air Force would not pursue the matter due to the possibility of causing Simonton embarrassment, which might prove injurious to his health. Let me just stop there for a second. Why? Why would it cause him embarrassment? He was already getting embarrassed by the newspapers, so if the Air Force was going to embarrass him, well, okay, that's just one more, some more fuel to the fire. I don't think he was, I think he didn't really care at this point, but anyway... Uh, continuing here, says, there was an uncharacteristic kindness on the part of the Air Force, or excuse me, this was an uncharacteristic kindness on the part of the Air Force. They regularly had been dismissing reports from pilots, even their own, as misidentifications or worse, hallucinations. Here's a quote, there are sufficient psychological explanations for reports not otherwise explainable, concluded the psychological branch of the Air Force's Aeromedical Laboratory in 1949. <laughs> Pilots, police, professors, besides regular folks, are all nuts. Basically, that's and that is, that's basically that's what their air force was. They, they were thinking that back in 1949. Anybody who sees these, any pilot that reports these, any citizen that reports these, obviously they have mental issues. That's what this all boils down to. Uh, in the 1960s, though, for a brief shining moment, the air force took on a human face. Uh, and held its collective tongue, bending over backward to carry the case of a part-time Santa and full-time chicken farmer as unexplained. Some may smell a conspiracy here. 
As for Simonton himself, in the end, he was left with a bitter taste in his mouth, and it wasn't from the pancakes. Here's a direct quote. He says, I, have, I haven't been able to work for three weeks. I'm going to have to start making some money. He said that the next, he, he said that the next time he saw a flying saucer, he would keep it to himself, but that uh, he did not. He actually saw saw uh, he experienced flying saucers again in 1970. Simonton was visited by Lee Alexander, a UFO enthusiast active in a Detroit-based investigative group. Simonton told Alexander that he, that he had had more visits from aliens, but he had not told anyone because of the way his first report had been received. So that's a very interesting story, and there's a lot of things I want to talk about here. Well, another thing that's not mentioned in this article is the fact that uh, the chickens on his, that he was had on his feet, it's over 20 chickens, they all died for some reason uh, shortly after this incident. Uh, that was something that was strange. Uh, and and I, I, I guess, what, what, what is, why did this happen if it's real? And I think this guy was telling the truth for as crazy as it sounds, right? It does sound insane. I mean, look at NICAP at the time. I mean, they, they wanted to be, they, they were trying to take UFO seriously and they didn't want to touch this case with a 10 foot pole because it looks so ridiculous. And it makes you wonder, sometimes I think that maybe these beings do these things on purpose. This is one of the theories I have. I have a couple of theories about what's going on here. One of my theories is, is, is that it could be some sort of extraterrestrial psyop. I mean, if you look at, uh, for instance, the 1955 uh, Hopkinsville, Kentucky goblin spree, where those whole family was uh, out living in the in the boonies, a lot of the people, uh, like eight or nine people in this family, were seeing. Uh, they one of them saw a, a flying saucer, looked like it was landing nearby, and then as the as throughout this entire night, then there was these little goblin-like creatures. Uh, trying to get in the house uh, all around. They were shooting at them with shotguns and nothing was happening to them. These beings were unaffected. What was the purpose of that? And I, I think that something really happened to those people, but what would, why would some intelligent race come down and, and try to do something like that? I think it could be some kind of an experiment. could be a psyop to see how uh, humans respond after something like this happens. Or, or, is, or is everyone else going to just say that they're all nuts? I mean, maybe that's what the, the purpose is. And maybe that was the purpose here. Uh, could be could be some kind of a psyop just to see what how human beings act uh or maybe it was uh maybe another uh, possibility is uh they they could have been doing this because uh they they really were trying to send a message i think in like for instance in the aerial school incident from 1994 i think the message was hey we need to take care or we're going to destroy ourselves i think that was the kind of message that they were trying to send out possibly we um, or could be who, who knows right but in this case maybe they're trying to say hey maybe you should start eating this kind of stuff because you're going to kill yourself with what you're eating here you're killing all these animals you're 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 getting fat look i mean look at why do you eat some of this and you'll be thin like us maybe that's what it was all about who knows or you know it could have been uh Maybe it was just a, they really had a they, they needed some water and they for cooking and they and they just landed and he happened to show up and it was like okay you know what we don't care that this guy sees us right now hey okay, could you, here's a, here's this jug could you go get us some water they didn't even know they, they, he didn't hear them say this he just he he said that they the guy motioned to him the alien motioned to, uh, like he needed a drink so he went and got water for him and then uh, they gave him these pancakes it's like okay fair exchange we'll see you later bloop. Maybe that's all it was. Who knows? But I think whatever the case, the guy was telling the truth. But what's really interesting here is like, you know, you always hear like people like Neil deGrasse Tyson out there running around. You know, how come nobody ever steals anything? They're, they don't come back with an alien ashtray, right? Ridiculous comments like that. You know, people get abducted all the time over the decades, right? And nobody's ever come back with any kind of evidence. It's not like people that haven't tried but here we have a case where this guy actually got some evidence of of the aliens he had these pancakes which were somewhat mysterious in their way they were tested and um they would seem normal according to the 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 unclassified reports on it but there have been rumors that uh some of the some of the uh, substances in there were very strange or the lack of substances i should say uh like salt so I don't know. There's there's something there now. Now Simonton did have a chance. Basically, they handed him this extraterrestrial jug, and he said it was unlike any kind of jug he's ever seen before. Uh, unfortunately, he should have maybe you know hid that in his cellar. Maybe he would have got away with it. 
but it's not for lack of trying. People have tried to take it. You, you, you look through the literature, right? There have been people over the decades uh, that have tried to uh, steal extraterrestrial items. For instance, uh, most famously was the uh, Betty and Barney Hill incident where there was a book that Betty saw that Betty saw during the abduction. And here's what it says here. This is from Captured, the Benny, Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience by Stanton Friedman and Kathleen Martin. Uh, and it states here, uh, Betty searched for a souvenir to take back with her to prove that she hadn't lost her mind. She found a large book full of symbols written in long, narrow columns. After joking with her, the leader, the alien leader, agreed to give Betty the proof that she needed to confirm that her abduction was real. When the remaining crew members discovered that she had the book, they took it from her and she became very angry. Then the leader apologized, stating that he saw no harm in giving it to her. However, he had been overruled. The crew had decided not to permit Betty and Barty to remember their experience, and therefore the book was taken away. I just want to say, I, I, I don't think the leader had any intentions of Betty uh, taking that book you know, to show it as, as show as proof later on either. I, I don't believe that one, but I think it was just psych, a psych. Psych! That's what I think was going on. I don't think that there was any intention whatsoever. And besides that, I don't think the those any of those aliens on board the ship that night uh, thought for a second that uh, Betty and Barney Hill were going to remember the experience. Uh, in fact, it seemed like they, they were pretty certain that they would not. But, of course, uh, they were both of them were having, or Betty was having nightmares. Barney was having some physical issues. Then they ended up going to a psychiatrist, and the rest is history. But, you know, I was actually, I found some other interest, another interesting story. Uh, uh, this was from uh, MysteriousAustralia.com. Uh, it's a new, it was a newsletter uh, about uh, UFOs, and I'll, I'll leave the link so you can check this out. Uh, but I want to read this one little piece here. This was something that happened in 1900. Uh, this is uh, by Rex Gilroy. Uh, he's talking about he received a phone call from a Mrs. Nareel. This, and this article was from 2008, by the way. He had received a phone call from a Mrs. Norell Cable of Brisbane. And, and uh, she told him the story about her great-grandfather, Andy Dixon, uh, in about, who in about 1900 was boundary riding one day on a West Queensland property. A part aboriginal, when he later related what he experienced, he was not believed by his employers. What follows has been passed down by the Dixon family. So there's, this is something that this a guy in 1900 in Australia says he was told his family for his whole life that he was abducted back in 1900. Mrs. Cable said that he was repairing a fence one day in a remote area on the edge of a patch of trees when he spotted approaching across the flat countryside from the west a big gray colored flying machine as he later described it. Andy was dumbfounded and uh, said Mrs. Cable and he was glued to the spot. His horse and, and a mule carrying equipment ran off. Let me just stop there for a second. I just want to not, I, I know it's going to be an afterthought, but his horse and a mule carrying equipment ran off. I was just talking the other day about animal reactions to uh, UFOs. Well, here we go. Back in 1900, they were running away back then too. Uh, the great machine had flown to a point high above him and descended to envelope him with a, within a great circular hollow. Then the momentary darkness in which he had been enveloped within ended as a bright silver light appeared from above. Three figures, all strangely clothed. Norell did not know what kind of clothes were worn by the men. Uh, and they appeared from a wide, tall door that suddenly opened from uh, one side of the encircling machine. These males led him into the door, and he found himself inside a circular room. Here the story goes, and he was set upon by several more of these men, all of whom were bluish-skinned. They removed all his clothes, and he was petrified with fear and unable to resist. All kinds of strange, incomprehensible machines were about were about the room. He was strapped to a metal table and the men touched him all over with handheld objects. Then they all moved to another room, leaving another man to release him. Andy quickly dressed. The man took him into another room through a door that the blue-skinned man opened by, opened by touching it with a finger. Here was a wide, tall window, and he could see they were above the clouds. All this time, none of the crew of this big flying machine, as Andy would call it when telling the story over the years, had spoken to him, but chattered to one another in some strange language of their own. 
He then found himself watching as the craft began descending. Before long, said Nareel Cable, as he watched from the window, the craft landed in a scrubby area. A door opened. At this, Andy is supposed to have seen a strange red-colored metallic instrument on a table nearby, and he grabbed it as he made his escape, perhaps as some proof of his, of his experience. But unfortunately, the aliens uh, that just kidnapped him were not going to have that, according to this story. It says here, he had no sooner left the craft when one of the strange men appeared and gave chase. Grabbing Andy, he took the instrument from him and returned to the craft, which rose up above the trees and flew away as a frightened Andy looked on. Perhaps Andy had been studied with the instruments held by the strange beings when he was first captured and they did not want him to leave with one of these highly technical instruments. The entire experience of my great-grandfather was probably not very long duration by the sound of it, but of course the details are hazy after all these years, uh, Mrs. Uh, Cable said. Very interesting. So it's not like for lack of trying. Sometimes people do get a chance of trying to get one of these objects, you know, one of these alien, quote, quote alien ashtrays as uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about. But you know what? These beings are way more intelligent than we, we are, and they have they we have no chance against them. They have it all figured out, obviously, um, outside of the pancakes uh, that uh, uh, Simonton received. Uh, that's that's about it. We, it's hard to get anything from these pe- from these things. It's just interesting, you know, uh, I, there was another story here in the same newsletter, which I'll, I'm going to talk about in a second. It's a little short piece, but I, 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 I want to mention it because of how uh, people who are skeptical about these all these stories. I mean, the, 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 there are so many different cases. I mean, it's, uh, oh, it's overwhelming when you really dig deep into this. You'll see them all. I mean, a lot of these stories like this one, I never... I mean, th- this was mentioned in, in, uh, in a book by uh, Albert Rosales, and that's probably about it. I mean, y- you'd have to have so much stuff, so many books in your library to, to, to know about some of these cases, or you'd have to be going through all these old newsletters online newsletters, old newsletters that were published uh, on paper back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I mean, you'd have to have so much stuff to put all of them together. It's 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 incomprehensible how much th- how many reports there have been throughout the years, how many encounters uh, people have had. It's incredible. But yet we have all these people, again, like debunkers, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who uh, it's all crazy, you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And that, that's how we've they've, they've always been treating this, right? They just can't get it through their thick heads that obviously these beings coming here are way more technologically advanced than us to such a degree that uh, they could pull all sorts of tricks on us and we would not have we would not know what and what what they were doing how they did it or or even if it was real or not i mean for all we know the case with uh simonton uh, that might have been for maybe it was a screen memory. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe they put a maybe these beings landed. He saw the flying saucer and then they put this uh, m- memory in his head that was false. And and maybe who knows? Maybe he was abducted and and prodded and then let go. And, and he had this memory in his head that was false. That's another explanation for that. There's just so many different things that they could. Uh, that, that an advanced race would be able to do to us and 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 and, and all the learned people so-called learned people around us who tell us oh there's nothing to this it's all crazy it's all but due to hallucinations and delusions and by uh, that people living in rural communities are having that's all it is uh, they just can't see it but when we're advanced we're going to be doing stuff like this like say uh, a, a 10,000 years ago uh, 10,000 years from now we go to some planet we travel to some planet outside of this solar system right and and we find a race of beings who are uh, like 21st century humans uh, we're not going to want to you know, land and tell them we're here we're, we're going to be secretive about it we're going to want to study them and figure that's what we're going to do They're, we're going to do the same thing to, to beings that we find later on on other planets that that uh, that beings that are coming here now are doing to us that's what's going on but here's like another example of of how over the years uh you know people don't believe these stories things happening there's multiple witnesses but yet uh other people can't believe it because they weren't there and they just think it's all crazy uh it says here well, this was from a case from 1926 in Australia. Uh, it says here, back in 1926, a small Aboriginal tribal group living in the Mount Isa back block backlogs of excuse me back blocks of Queensland told others that they had been visited one night as everyone sat at the edge of a waterhole campfire talking. 
from what they told other Aborigines of the region, a big black object came down from the sky and apparently a not large number of pygmy height beings emerged and rounded up 20 or so tribespeople and children, herding them into the craft. Then the little people took away the children for some reason, but later returned them. The craft apparently rose into the air and flew away somewhere beyond the clouds, it was said. The details are hazy, but it appears that the craft returned its captives through the clouds early the next morning to a location a few miles from where they had been abducted. The side of the craft opened and by the by now terrified aborigines ran out screaming. Uh, and then local uh, settlers, oh, they heard this, uh, oh, these aborigines, oh, <laughs> they're crazy. They let her heard this tale and laughed it off. But then UFOs were, uh, of course, unknown to the public by that, at that point. So I think that's another interesting little uh, segment just to show you how, you know, multiple witnesses, a multiple abduction case back in 1926. But, you know, they talk about this to other people and the other people think that's completely insane. That's no way that that happened. Uh, it's, I guess in this case, in this phenomenon, regarding the UFO phenomenon, the extraterrestrial presence phenomenon, it's, 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 it's seeing is believing uh, for the most part, especially when you have uh, leaders who know about this via the, uh, crash retrievals and the reverse engineering programs pretending that the, they know nothing of this when they actually they do. Uh, that's, that's the issue here. Uh, they don't want to upset the apple cart for various reasons. Uh, but anyway... Uh, I just want to say, uh, yeah, I thought that this, I, I think that uh, the story with Joe Simonton was uh, legitimate. I think that the guy was telling the truth. Uh, I think he really did, re you know, I think he did have an encounter for sure exactly why this happened. I guess we can only speculate. Uh, why would this, why would aliens do something like this? Why would they hand him these pancakes? I don't know. It, it's a crazy story. But the guy, as you see in the video, he was very sincere, and uh, I do not believe that he was lying. I think he was telling us actually what he really believed. He actually said he he, he knew that nobody was going to believe him. He told that to uh, J. Allen Hynek. He, he said, I know no one's going to believe me, but I'm going to, this is what happened. And actually, Blue Book did, you know, they said it was unexplained, even though privately they were just, eh, well, let's be easy on this guy, uh, according to this article that I read anyhow. So, uh, yeah, I think it's an incredible story, and uh, I, I, uh, it's one of, the, one of my favorites. I, it's, one of the, it's, it's mysterious, and, but I think it's believable. That we, why that this happened, we'll, 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 we'll never know, I, I don't believe, but very interesting story. Anyway, I want to say thank you all for joining me. Until next time.